Hi, and welcome to the SLP Stress Management Podcast, your place to manage stress, reduce burnout, and find more balance in your life. I am your host, Jesse Andrix, and I am absolutely thrilled to be here today talking with our fellow SLP and just like dynamic, incredible woman, Fong Lin Palafox. I am so excited to have you here today. I feel, I actually feel really calm about being here today and fueled, <sighs> and those are two good places to be. Yes, those are some of the best places to be. Um, those are the like the good excitement, right? you know. Uh -huh. Yes, <laughs> yes. So I know that you have, you know, I first was introduced to you through um, during the summer and even a little bit before, but through the folks at SLP Summit and SLP Toolkit. Um, and I know a lot of fellow SLPs and you know people listening might be familiar with you from there and familiar with some of your story and what you do. But for those that are not, can you share a little bit about um, you know your work as an SLP and maybe even a little bit about some of the journey with stress that you've experienced as an SLP? Yes, yes to, to all of it. Awesome. Oh, my SLP narrative, my um, speechy path, so I joined our profession um, because my closest friend, who, who then became a boyfriend, as that's how life works sometimes, mm -hmm. in uh, middle school and high school, is a person who stutters. So that's what got me into the field in the first place. Um, and I knew that I would be in the schools because that is where... I had quiet whisperings as a kid, like, you're going to be a teacher in some capacity and you're going to do that work with children. Um, so I was a school-based SLP for, I mean, technically, I, I still am in some capacity. So mm -hmm. I did that for a while. And, and you know, whenever things, um, whenever I think you, you work hard and you do the things that... Um, that you're passionate about, people give you more responsibilities. So then I was um, privileged enough uh, to become a SLP lead for a large district of about 50 speech language pathologists. And then they give you more responsibilities. So then I supported um, Central Texas uh, speech language pathologists. Um, and I was also the autism specialist there. And then I moved into a clinic that supported it with home health capacity and also in the school districts. And then I also had clients in the clinic. And so I think for me, this journey has been, you know, I have the whole spectrum. I think my heart will always be a school-based speech language pathologist. Um, and I have scope and perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that because of I, I love our profession so much, Jesse. Like, <laughs> I think people think that I'm very, um, I'm kind of stuck up with, with the impact we make and rightfully so, like, hell yes. Like, this is the work that we do and we change lives and we, every session we have, we, um, we go in and we make an impact on someone's story, how they can uh -huh. tell their story and tell their meaningful, relevant experiences. Um, so in the last, I would say, I don't know, eight-ish, eight, nine-ish years, um, I've had the opportunity, it, once a month, I will travel, not right now during the pandemic, um, to go share my story and potentially useful strategies and acknowledgement of SLP paths um, at state organizations or national organizations. Um, and then right now, I have my own personal endeavor where I see my own clients, I consult with speech language pathologists and SLPs to be, and then um, I also support with presentations. But it's all remote now, so that's what I do. Oh, that is that is a lot, and it's quite a journey from you know being in the school where you know I think it's important to, that you share that that's where you started, and it's branched out to so many places. And and I mean, that is quite a journey of like where you've gone and where you are now. And I know a lot of people in the schools um, want to, to be in the school, but then sometimes they want to kind of grow their profession and they're not sure what that might look like. So that is a beautiful path. It is a, it is a brutal <laughs> and beautiful. I was, 
you're going to hear a lot of ands today. So my my word for the, this season in my life is and, which is a conjunction, right? And it means mm -hmm. that multiple truths exist. And so, um, and I'll acknowledge all of it. And, and I'll tell you right now, Jesse, I feel like for a long time, I'm very positive and people are like, oh, you're so energetic and you bring this good energy. And I'm all of those things. But for, for this part, I would say in the last year to two years, I, I, I will find a way to be proactive. Um, and I will be really honest. Um, so that's what you're going to get. Cause I, I love I don't it. Have the capacity to, to just not anymore. Yeah. But it's, you know, we can stay optimistic, but stay true to the truth of, of what's going on, you know, because yeah. it is such a, um, before the pandemic, it was such a hard field to be in, to yes. like sustain in. And now this year has shown us that we can grow and do things we didn't think we could do, but it doesn't mean that it's easy or sustainable or a place that we want to be in, but yeah. we can, or, and, <laughs> no, <laughs> and we can keep going with it. Right. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, I think you bring up a really good point in that, you know, for, and it's just not our school base, it's our clinic base too. Cause I did that uh -huh. for, I think seven years, um, is that the, the pre pandemic life is not the life that I want to return to as a speech language pathologist. I mean, there were already so many things that could be changed. And so while I acknowledge all of the hard right now, the one thing that keeps me buoyed in sustaining is that, um, I mean, <laughs> we're kind of at a reckoning right now in our profession and in our country. And so I think, you know, now's the time to just kind of say, Phew let's start over or at least let's unveil some of the truths because things aren't going to change unless we, we acknowledge it. And I also admit that by acknowledging it and being truthful, that's a privilege as well. Cause not all of us feel safe enough to, to share those truths, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what, you know, with, with being someone that worked as, you know, the, the lead SLP in your district and then in the broader districts, what are some things that you found for yourself or for those SLPs that you were able to do to help either advocate to make things better or things that, you know, you could do on a daily basis to help reduce some of that pressure that's felt? Okay. So I will, hmm, that's a good big question. <laughs> my mind knew that you would ask this question and then my heart is like you should have organized a little bit better but I will try my best so I'm gonna start out at a big kind of more human macro level and then I'll yeah. get over to the speechy side of things so I think in terms of day-to-day -day management of life in supporting speech language pathologists I think the first thing is just remembering the first and foremost at the foundation of it all like if this was like instead of Maslow's hierarchy, this is like Fong's SLP hierarchy. <laughs> the bottom of it is, is your why. Like, why did you join this profession yes. in the first place? So this is Simon Sinek stuff. And I mean, I read all of those books and our whys are, I, I mean, they're so vastly different. And to me, it's kind of like, like envision a human being and it's your spine. It's what, it's what's going to sustain you. Or if you're like a planet, it's like your axis that keeps you kind of rotating where you don't tilt and you don't spin out of, you know, where you need to be. And so for me, you know, my why is wanting to, to walk alongside. I don't save people. I don't make them better. I just walk alongside them in these hard um, and difficult journeys. And it's such an honor to be able to walk alongside them in this communication journey. So my why goes back to my own story. And I think that's where we have to dive a little bit deeper about why we're here and why we chose this profession in the first place. Um, and I have to briefly share this story. Otherwise, you won't know um, why I am the way that I am. So my, for my, me, my why, my parents were Vietnamese refugees. My dad fought for South Vietnam. That was a bust. He didn't go so well. He was a POW for two years. And then after he got out of jail, him and my mother were given the opportunity, bestowed the opportunity to be refugees on a wooden boat across the South China Sea. So they were there for 11 days. And on the 11th day, they finally got to their destination, 
which is, which was Hong Kong. Now, Hong Kong at the time, they were taking in refugees. Now, at that time, there were so many Vietnamese boat people that countries were saying, nope, we are at full capacity. We are not accepting people. Um, but Hong Kong did not. So they got there. And at three o'clock the next morning, I was born. And so oh. I feel, you know, sometimes I think like fa- this is the foundation of everything that I do personally and professionally. And so my why, I think part of it is honoring their story and knowing I'm probably, I will get emotional. That's the other thing you'll know about me. I cry every day. Um, and emotion is, is who I am and I won't apologize for it anymore. Um, and it's my superpower, but you'll hear tears likely or some voice quivering, but you know, that's, I I think about that. Like they, they did, they did so much and they worked so hard. So I will do what I can to help people that share the same story and that feel differently when they're in a new place and don't know the language. So as long as I can go back to my foundation and my why, I feel like it at least reminds me, it keeps me centered. So after that, in terms of now going back to speech language pathology, you have to know your why. And then the second part, I feel, oh, my school-based SOPs, that I want you to know that your work is impactful and it's meaningful and all of the hard stuff is not you. And I, I think right now it's so easy for us as helpers, being in the helping profession, to always want to do more and to help more because it's one of our pillars, right? Like you can look at the field of speech language pathology and go, yep, we're definitely a very specialized breed. Now we're all different and individualized within, you know, our own bodies, but as a whole, we, we got into this profession to help. But because we always want to help, I think it's really hard to create those boundaries to say, I'm not going to help in this case. And I acknowledge the SOPs that sometimes by you thinking that you're helping or you're doing more, you're actually not. Um, Mm -hmm. And so if you sustain yourself and if you stay true to why you joined this profession in the first place, and if something happens, for example, hey, Jessie um, at the other campus needs help with her caseload. Um, She's really overwhelmed right now. Would you be willing to take five more students? Or, you know, Travis at the high school, you know, he got so many requests for evaluations. Do you mind um, taking on three of those evals? You know, we just signed consent, so you've got a little bit of time to do it. Or right now in the clinic, we're getting an influx of clients, and um, I need for you to take this evaluation on Friday because I see you have a little bit of time on your schedule. And then we have one more next week. But I, you know, I see that you might be able to work some things around. Um, So we say yes, because we want to help. When in reality, we're feeding a system that is, you know, making us work beyond our bandwidth. Um, And then at the same time, we're depleting ourselves and dimming our light. Um, And then many of us are just thinking that we're not able to, and we're not capable, and we're not good enough, or I'm not working hard enough, or how come Chelsea's able to do it over there, but I'm not able to do it myself. Um, So that would be the second part, right? Foundation is Uh your why. The next part is your kindness fuels the profession, and the way that you are going to be kind, like the beautiful Brene Brown says, is to be clear and honest, and that's creating like the yes. long boundaries are deep well they could be deeper they're getting deeper <laughs> I, this is a journey that fong is working that i'm working on um and then the next part is and i love this part i was actually thinking about this last night but i told myself fong it's friday you really shouldn't be working right now so i stopped i closed my computer is that in the field of speech language pathology If you go to this website by this group called ASHA, the American Speech Language Hearing Association, and you type in evidence-based practices, um, there's a definition of what evidence-based practices looks like. And if you look at that definition, it is divided into three equal parts. So 
when people are, when you're in an IEP meeting or if you are doing something in a clinic, home health, wherever you are, we are supposed to be doing evidence-based practices. It's what ethically we're supposed to be doing or trying to work toward. I do think it's kind of used as a fear factor, which we can talk about that later or not. So the three parts of evidence-based practices. The first part is the external research. That's what we talk about all the time. What does the research say? What did, you know, is this, is this evidence-based? Da, da, da. And when they say evidence-based, they don't mean the whole definition. They just mean the external research. Okay. So that's one part of it. And I will always say that our research, though I honor it, is way behind on humanity. Mm -hmm. It just is. So that's one part. The second part is your SLP expertise and opinion. And it says that, SLP expertise and opinion. So that's you. So that's what Jesse thinks and feels. It's what you learned in undergrad and graduate school and in potentially the research papers that are not written to be digestible in an easy format in any capacity. It's what you extrapolate from that, right? And, and what your opinion and your experience. And so to me, part of that is, hey, Fong's been in the field for 20 years. Here's what my experience says. Here's what my gut says. And here is some research that I have read at some point along the way that supports it. Okay. By the way, opinions change. So uh -huh. to me, within that evidence base, like third, that means that you can change your mind. And honestly, you should, because our field should always be growing and changing. And then the last part is client, student, family perspective. Um, there was an SLP on Instagram that called it the soul of speech language pathology, because this is where I put a lot of my emphasis. So this is how people feel and how they think and their experiences and their narratives. Um, and I, and that's just as equal as the other two parts. So all three of those parts makes up evidence-based services right? For speech language pathology. And that last part, that's your humanity. That is why we chose to be in this profession in the first place, because we want to walk alongside these communication journeys. And so sometimes I, I, I give SLPs permission. I'm like, yo, this is the definition of evidence-based practices. You are already doing most of these things. And, and gut tells me that that last part, the part where you're like, well, I didn't get to this part of the evaluation yet, or I, um, I haven't done X, Y, or Z. It's all about the external research part. When in reality, your, your humanity part is already fueling a good chunk of what you're doing with your people. So. Mm -hmm. That is such a, uh, it's, I think that that is such an important piece and, and they're just an important thing to bring up because I know for me, it's something that every time that I've heard you talk about it and heard other, you know, just, just kind of had that brought up, it just reminds me that it is not all about the research. The research is important, but like you said, it's behind and there's more to it. And it was one of the reasons that I did not feel connected when I first started and it led me to quit um, for five years because I felt that there was, that we were so focused on research that we were losing our connections with our why mm -hmm. and then losing our connections using that, the human piece of, okay, this is what, you know, we're supposed to be doing, but this might not work for this in this way. This, this person may need something different. Mm -hmm. And if we can offer that, why aren't we doing it? Um, you know, it was, it was very rigid and, and it really, you know, um, I, I think that getting into the field for me and then, you know, starting out as a new clinician, I had like very big dreams and this very, very big like um, image and, and what I was envisioning doing and all of these things. Um, it was like a very romantic view of, <laughs> of life and of being an SLP. And then, you know, when it's like you have that and then everything is like, but the research says this. It's kind of like a, a big downer. So. <laughs> it is. It is. And I think the one thing to think, you know, and I, I actually did start my PhD. I quit after um, one semester. That was in 2004. Um, mm -hmm. 
So I, I do. I honor the research part of it, but we have to acknowledge here's the and part, right? Research is great. And the people who are doing the research are not doing the most representative research, and they do not represent the majority of the demographics of the people that we're serving. And, you know, it's a, it's a, a representation, if you look at the data, of individuals who had the privilege of going to college and more college and more college. Um, and no one will ever convince me that research is always going to outweigh personal stories. Like, it just doesn't work. And so you could say, here's the research. And then you go over here and here's the family. And they're like, I'm not okay with doing that. You know, this doesn't align <laughs> with, with, with what I, I, I want and, and what I want for my child or my grandfather or my father. Um, so, you, you know, as a, as a clinician and as a school-based SLP, you have to figure those things out. And honestly, before you even figure it out, you have to, you have to connect with the family to build the trust, to even hear the stories about what's important to them. Like what I've been doing lately. So as I've started my own work, um, I get to write my own reports in the way that I've always wanted to write my report. And um, now what I do is I, I, in my intake form, I ask families, what are you looking for in a speech language pathologist? Like, and it's an open-ended question to look at their qualities. And it's really interesting, the response. And I would say, I did a, a little... I, I don't know what it would call, a, like a case study. It wasn't a research-based study, but I keep in contact with all of the families that most, a lot of the families that I've connected with in the last two decades from graduate school on. And so I reached out to them about two years ago and I said, all right, I'm going to do this, this informal study and I want you to t list the top three qualities that you want in a speech language pathologist. So I took all the families and each family could give up to three responses. And what was interesting was that 92 of the 92% of the qualities that they talked about had nothing to do with speech language pathology. It was like, <laughs> please be flexible. Give me, communicate with me. Like, let me know what's going on. Um, uh, have fun with my kid, make it a fun environment so that he wants to come, make him, you know, have him feel good and find a way to motivate him to have him work hard. So it was really interesting. You know, I do feel like there's a gap in what we assume families want um, and, and, and what we're, what they really do want, which is the, yeah. the people part. Yeah. And it's so true. It's almost like, like, it's not discounting the research or, you know, no. saying that research is not important because especially this year, we know research is just in scientists research and research yes. are so important and so, so important. crucial. Yes. Oh. Get dive into No, I, right? I really believe in science. I want that acknowledged in all capacities. Okay. But it's, it's like you said, though, that it's it's almost like we look at it backwards. Like we think first the research, then we start to, you know, get down to the connection part. Like the connection will come from proving we know all the research, mm -hmm. but it's really the reverse that we need to know, you know, like you said, knowing what they're really wanting, that it's important to them that their family is having a good experience or that they know what's going on and that they are, part of this, you know, that the family is part of what's going on rather than just being told, you know, you stay in the waiting room, I'm going to do this, or here's what we did with your kid today at school or this year, and this is what we're doing. Um, Jackie, yes, I, I loved it. I loved it. Directive. So, <laughs> first, I loved it. That the way that you said that was beautiful. That should be like Thank first you. the the humanity and then the research part. And you know, it, the the other part too is that like to do all of this stuff. Like, there's grief in a lot of the work that we do for mm -hmm. families, right? There's there's the grief of thinking this is the path that I'm on for my my family member, and now er, we're we're flanking and taking a complete different and worthy and relevant and valuable path, but it's different than what you had assumed. And so, you know, I think just saying, hey, I'm checking in with you. I'm going to earn your trust. And then I'm going to hear more of your story. And then I'm going to put together a game plan because I have this awesome SLP privilege brain that I acquired. So, but I yeah. <laughs> yeah, it it is, it is so, um, the connection piece, I think, you know, it, it just keeps us connected to our why. And I know for me, when I came, I took a five-year break. And when I came back into the field, the connection was 
um, it was what I started with. It was like, that was my, my place. Like, if I'm not going to feel connected, then this isn't going to work this time. And so that's what I really worked on. And just trying to see, like, I worked in teletherapy with schools, with virtual schools. So I actually got to see the kids while they were at home. And so I got to know their families, which I really loved, yeah. um, but still help them out from the school perspective. And just knowing that and seeing like realistically what was going on in their lives behind the, the you know, just what we're focused on in school, like really seeing what they were dealing with at home. And then mm -hmm. also like being able to, to connect with their parents and say like, you know, where they would be like, hey, you know, today your session might be a little harder. They've been having a really rough morning or, you know, we didn't sleep well last night or, you know, we, we had this thing happen yesterday. So we're trying to work through that today, but allowing space for that, for the family. And then just being able to, to get to know them on that little extra level where you could say that like, okay, so we're not going to hit the goal this month that maybe we wanted them to reach to, but we're, you know, we're able to, to support them still and to be there for 30 minutes twice a week or whatever it might be and just, you know, give them connection and give them light and love and whatever it might be was so much more important than oh if goodness. they could say there are. To me, it was just like, that's what shifted for me and kept me like connected to my, why am I even here? Yeah. <laughs> like, why am I doing this? Right. You know, I, um, you know, I, I say that most days are, are head days. It's where we are able to work on the communication part. So the speech sound mm -hmm. production or putting together your story. Um, so most days are head days and then some days are heart days. And those are the days where you just have to, you just have to hold space for the person for all of their, their big feelings. And that's also the time. And it's crucial where you sustain that trust that you have with that person. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. You know, I, I always think about, clients and students. I get to do a lot of uh, maternity um, and one paternity leave uh, where I go in for a truncated amount of time for three months and I help out in the schools. And what has happened a handful of times is that, you know, SLPs will say, oh, well, here's, here's the one kid. He's going to give you a lot of, you know, and you know, I, I, I honestly, I don't, enjoy those stories um, mm -hmm. because every human being is new. Um, but it's also my way of cueing in to be like, this is, this is the, the human that I need to concentrate on and really build a connection and really build that rapport and really find a way to, to add more to that trust jar. Um, and when you do, it's a beautiful, lovely thing. It's amazing what you see from that person who may not have had it before. And, and the other part is their parent, you know, when they do something exceptional and lovely and you call and you say, Hey, did you know that, um, Joey today did this? Um, I just wanted to share it with you. And the parents are like, wait, what? I thought this call was going to go totally a different way. Cause it usually does. Mm -hmm. And so you're just kind of building, um, you're building that connection on all ends. And, you know, it, it's incredible what families are willing to do whenever they know that you love their child as a person first and then as a communicator second, um, is that whenever you do make recommendations and you suggest something, they know that it's from a place of love. So they support you in that. It actually makes your job so much easier in so many ways. Yeah, I, I absolutely, uh, that's been my experience too with that. And um, I think it's something that's really hard sometimes for us to do as SLPs because when the caseloads get big, whether you're in school or clinic or, you know, wherever it's at, when caseloads grow, you feel overwhelmed, you feel stressed. And then one of the things that starts to happen when we're like, you know, chronically stressed or heading towards that burnout is like cynicism. Mm -hmm. And so we start to kind of, it's almost like disconnecting from that why or from the more like compassionate part. It's just too much to feel that. And, it, you know, like there's not enough space for it really. So then we start to approach things with more of the cynical, like, oh, great, here we go again. Just, you know, this happened, you know, with this, we kind of get that, like, well, this family again, we know how this is going to turn out or mm -hmm. we expect this. And then 
it just kind of spirals from there and then we get more stressed and it's like this big cycle. I call it the cycle of stress. We just get stuck mm-hmm. in this where it just keeps feeding itself until we're just like, how are, you know, like, when did we end up here? And how is this like, what happened to the, you know, the, the heart we used to feel? You know, I, I'm, I'm really glad that you said that because that's exactly what's happening right now. And I think the first thing is just like what you just did is to name it, right? Like to say, wait a second, like this is not what I'm feeling right now. I, usually it's it's me going, something feels off, like hold up. Like why am I being snarkier than usual or why am I being X, Y, or Z? And the other part too is that that cynicism, I'm going to reframe it. And I, I, I feel like what it is, it's self-preservation. It's, mm-hmm. it's just saying, all right, something's going on in my external world, right? And it's not aligning with my spine, why I joined this profession in the first place. So I'm shutting down parts of me to preserve myself in order to just sustain myself. Um, and I think just by saying, all right, this is what's happening. I think that in itself helps it. Naming anything always helps it. Like, oh, you are a person with anxiety and depression. Oh, that's that's part of the the reason. Or, you know, this is this is why you are crying all the time. Oh, well, I just thought that's just how I am. Um, so I think I think naming it. So going back to your initial question, Jesse, of you know, what can SLPs do with my SLP you like how I'm circling back? I'm really proud of remembering <laughs> the initial question. Um, good job in, in thoughtfully guiding me back. Is you know, right now if if people say, hey, you know, I need for you to do more. I say, one, you can always ask for help. I remembered years ago, yes. there is a speech language pathologist. So I would go visit them twice a semester to have like these heart to heart SLP conversations. And honestly, it was just checking in. And we had two leads in the district. We were very lucky. And um, Tammy took care of the business side and the funding side and and a lot of um, more of the technical aspects of the position. And I was the socio-emotional leader because that is my wheelhouse. So I would go in and like SLPs would just start crying because they felt safe. So I, mm-hmm. I, I held that. I mean, I, I really do hold that part of my, my work to heart. And this SLP wouldn't stop crying. I'm like, tell me about it. What's going on? And she's like, I'm getting home at like between seven and eight o'clock every night because I can't get my work done. I don't see one kid that I have because he's already in bed. And then I have another kid there. And then I do what I need to do. I eat and then I go right back to work. And we are hanging out in the spring. And I was like, what? I had no idea. I had no idea as her lead that this is what she was going through. And, you know, I did what I thought was like, hey, checking in. How are you doing? How are things? And da, 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 da. But she didn't feel safe. And that's not, that's not a fault thing. I can't say, well, why, you know, she didn't feel safe telling me. But in that moment, she did. And so we put together a plan. But there was no way I could have put together that plan if she hadn't told me that I need this help. And what's amazing is that speech pathologists have reached out in the last couple of months. And they're like, Oh my gosh, wow. Like a, a bilingual SOP was like, I just said, I really need help. And they gave me help. And then um, another SOP was like, I told them, um, I can't do that. I, I I need some more help with these assessments. And they gave it to me. Um, so, you know, people can always say no. Um, and you can get the help that you want, which is amazing. So that's yes. the first part. The other part too, is that you can create the boundary. So if they say, here's more work, I usually respond with, tell me what that looks like. And then I just oh, I stop like talking. So if, and it's usually, right, it's some, a, an SLP lead coming my way, a clinical director saying, you know, I, we have this opportunity for you. I want you to take this campus. It's a maternity leave. And it's just a little bit, it's going to be just for a couple of months. Um, and I'm, I'm saying these things because these things have been spoken to. Mm-hmm. It's just for a few months until we get through the end of the school year, or until we get to spring break, or until we get to the winter holiday. Like, I am done with that shit. Like, when people say, it's just for a small <laughs> amount of time. It's, I mean, You're that's, like, that's not going to happen. <laughs> no, I mean, and like, why would you even say that to someone and say, oh, it's just for a few months? Are you kidding me? Do you know how many days of work are in a few months of work? So I, what I do now is I look at the person and I say, tell me about that. And then they tell me, and usually it, I will say in my experience, sometimes it's detailed, but most of the time it's not. So it's like, there's a campus and you'll be there two days. And, um, you know, I, I think, I think, 
I definitely think it's doable. So then I, I start asking, and if I say, tell me more about it, and they're not able to, I start asking questions. Or if in the moment I don't feel safe enough to ask the questions, I say, give me more information about that. I'd like to know exactly how many students, how many initial evaluations are there, and how many reavals, and how many IEP meetings are scheduled from this point until the end. And then while I'm transitioning to this new schedule, could you... Um, Tell me how I'm going to be able to get support for the IEPs that are due in the next two weeks. Nice. And I stop. And I think I what I used to do is I would say, of course I can help. And then I go home and I cry and then I get stressed out mm-hmm. and I'm resentful. I'm resentful of the whole entire experience. And that stupid stuff gets into my brain and pushes out all that cortisol into my body. Um But now I just say, tell me what that looks like. And I've noticed too, that when you say, tell me what that looks like. And then I even given people my, my calendar and I I mean, it's not a game, but it's like, could you help me figure out how to schedule this within my workday? And I just hand the sheet of paper with my schedule. Yeah, that's a good technique. (laughs) But you don't, but the whole time in my head, I'm like, Fong, do not say okay. Like, I mean, I'm, I have to keep reminding myself, like, because my natural tendency is to be like, of course I can help. And then I just have it be silent. I've gotten really comfortable with silence, I would say, in the last decade. That's, it's, that's so, it's so helpful, though, because I I mean, I, I think that maybe a lot of SLPs are this way, but I'm the same way, that you feel, or you hear yourself saying, yes, of course I can do this. Or you're right. I do have, you know, could I take on five more students for you? Like, of course I could squeeze them in and find some way to make this work. But then inside you're saying, or like you said, when you get home, you're crying. Like inside you're thinking like, I don't want to do it. 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 (laughs) And, and, but we feel like we almost have to, like, it's not okay to ask for help or to say, I just, cannot in this moment or to even get just more information on, I don't know if this will work. Can we talk about it and figure out what this is going to look like? Um, Yeah. And it is hard to say, because it doesn't feel natural to say, Mm -hmm. not right now. Because we're conditioned to to want to. Yeah. And I wonder if that's like a grad school thing or if it's just who we are to, you know, like if it's part of who we are as we enter the field, like, or why we get into the field, it's just kind of a trait that we tend to have. Or if it's like, if it's part of what we experience in training, you know, this is not, this is not evidence. I don't know. (laughs) Opinion. This is my my opinion. I think um, part of it is because we are helpers. I Mm -hmm. think as a majority of our profession is female. And I think as females, we are conditioned to do these things. And I will not dive into all of that. But I think it's a part of a lot of conditioning that happened since birth. Like, yeah. here are your roles and your responsibilities. And I want you to be able to work yourself because that's how you show your love and your compassion and your worth in this world is to help and give and give and give and give until you die. Mm-hmm. And so I think now it's saying like, you know what? No. And the other thing too is that we're using the wrong word because you're not helping when you do do the work. Because the goal that we want right. is to be able to serve our clients and our students and our patients and our humanity well. What you're doing in truth is you are feeding the system to check mark the compliance that is demanded of us. And the compliance that is demanded of us does not account for our workload, which in many states do not have um, boundaries. Right. So it's saying, all right, well, these IEPs are due, this report is due, this the, the progress notes are due, you need to turn in this report for authorization, da 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 But where else in the world, I mean, even if you compare teachers, and I'm not saying that teachers' jobs are easy, because they are not, but there's at least a, uh, and I know that there's workload and caseload that we're talking about right now, but we are so far beyond caseload and workload that I think the whole thing is comical. Mm-hmm. Um, so 
if you are saying yes to it, think about why you're saying yes. And I promise you that the reason why you're saying yes is not going to feed the reason why we are doing this work, which is to truly help the students. What would help students and families and clients and patients is if we could do our work well. Yes. So. Absolutely. It's so exhausting being an adult. Right? I know. It's so hard. It is. It is a critical thinking and responsibilities and like, yeah, it is. When, it what is. I want to do when people tell me this thing is I want to flip them in the in between their eyeballs. Like I want to flip them. And I want to laugh. I mean, the, my um, partner in crime, Jeremy, I, I married the kindest human. And, you know, at the end of our days as work from home, we have three human beings wandering around, a cat, an elderly cat, and two rescue bunnies. Oh and gosh. I mean, it's horrible. I mean, my day-to-day -day life is maddening. But at least at the end of the day, we can still laugh about how horrible it is. We're like, oh, yeah, the five-year-old threw up on me. And then I was like, yo, Zoom, I'm going to talk about Right. <laughs> with vomit on my shirt, but you can't see it. Right, it's below the screen, so it's <sighs> fine. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's it's fun. It's fun. It's fun. But I mean, I think that's where we're at right now, but I, I, I want SLPs to know, like you're worthy of holding space for, you're worth not dying and, and being sad. Um, and you know, with all of the burnout, we're getting sick. I mean, that's the thing is that uh -huh. because I have this superpower of SLPs divulging a lot of personal and private things to me, people are getting sick. And I mean, they're whispering to me in the corner right before a presentation, like, Hey, Bob, I'm actually on, on leave and I'm not working right now. When you're whispering to me about something that tells me that this, this whole thing is effed up. Like this is not okay. And you cannot be the sacrificial lamb in all of this. Like, it's not okay. Or like an SLP saying, yeah, I thought I was having like, you know, some type of coughing thing for the last four days because I couldn't breathe. Well, I went to the doctor and I was having a four-day panic attack. And oh. good SLPs are leaving. I mean, like, Jesse, how did we get here? I don't know, right? That's like, I mean, that's like my big question that I always come back to. But for like, for the type of, work that like you and I both do, like the work we do beyond our SLP work, like our, our figuring out the almost like mystery of like, what is going on in this SLP world? Um, and how did it get here? And where is it starting from? And what do we do to help? That's it. Like how, how did this even happen where we are sacrificing our health? And that's what, like, we're, we're sacrificing our health, we're sacrificing our relationships, but it's, like, mental health and, like you said, it's physical health, too. Mm -hmm. It's, um, it's just incredible. And then, and then for some reason, we end up thinking either we, we have the mantra in our head of, this is fine, this is fine, this is fine, yeah, it's fine, right? Yeah, it's fine. Um, or of you know, the like, well, this is just how it is. Like, this is how it's supposed to be. This is what being, you know, an adult is, or this is what life is just supposed to be like. Um, but then when you sit with it, you, it's like deep down, you know, it's not supposed to, or it, it maybe not even supposed to, like, it doesn't have to be this way, mm -mm. but it's kind of how things operate. You know, you're right. It's, it's how, so someone told me a long time ago, not, when, when did this happen? I know exactly what this happened. Um, and I love her for saying this. She goes, you are so aggressively positive. <laughs> I was like, huh. But you know what? I own it and I am. So I acknowledge all of this. This is where we are right now. And part of me feels like I know the time, at least at, through the school districts where I felt like for at least in the state of Texas, what state are you in, Jesse? I'm in North Carolina, oh, but, oh, wait, I love North Carolina, but I've never actually worked as an SLP um, for, like, I moved here after I started in teletherapy, okay. and so I have never um, served anyone in North Carolina as an SLP. Okay. All of my licenses were in um, other states, so, like, I'm licensed in North Carolina, but I was in teletherapy and then moved to, like, the... Um, 
management support and then even like marketing role for a company. Mm -hmm. And then uh, 2020 happened. So Mm -hmm. then um, I'm at home now and which is like wonderful and and it and sometimes not, but it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine, right? No, <laughs> um, yeah, but but so um, so I haven't been able to like get out into the field in North Carolina, so I don't know a lot about the specific like procedures of the state. You know, you know how like each state kind of has their own yeah. way of. There, yeah. there are, um, and SLPs will tell you what they're, and I'm so glad. So I will say that for the state of Texas, and this happened in a handful of other states as well, is that in 2011, that was right around the time whenever I was lead for the school district, is that our educational funding got cut within the state. And so what happened is that the monies that that, that impacted went from general education and then it trickled down to special education, right? Which is our arena Uh in terms of servicing students. And so funding got cut. So then that meant that new positions could not be fulfilled. And so the manpower, the woman power that we had, um, had to do the work that existed. And on top of that, eligibility and assessments, um, are much more thorough, you know, as time advances. So we were qualifying more individuals. And with the advent of, you know, uh, media going out and saying, your child could get services through, you know, early intervention and then transition to schools. So we had an influx of human beings who needed services. And then our human capacity kind of remained the same. And I felt like within, that was kind of when things started to shift drastically for school districts. In the business clinical side of things, I think that what happened is that people are being more aware of the, they're more aware of the services, but what's also happening is that there are also parameters put in place for, I know for our bilingual um, population, people who superpower um, their native language influences is outside of English, there have been rules and parameters put into place. So we're actually having to do more in our day-to-day for authorizations and for eligibility, and our caseload is going up. Um, So I think that's why. And because of all of that too, there's more compliance and there's more legal things that we need to do. And so you add all of this stuff on that is outside of the actual therapy part, um, which then increases the workload, yet we still have to maintain all of the ethics and roles and responsibilities of being a speech language pathologist. Um, but I can tell you how I cope in my day to day. Would you like to hear yes, about that? I would. Okay. <laughs> so I, um, I feel that, uh, you know, whenever you are burned out and you have um, all of those things are increasing, it's really easy to check out. And the easiest way to check out is social media because you're Uh like, I don't have to deal. I can look at pictures of, you know, goats while people are doing yoga. And that sounds like fun. So I'm going to fall into this trap of, you know, does it exist in Austin, Texas? And so, you know, what I've come to realize is that me going to bed at night or waking up in the morning, I would never invite hundreds to thousands of people into my bedroom. So why would I invite them into my brain and into my heart? And so I have put more firm boundaries. And um, and I always say, you know, trying to because I'm always working at it. Or whenever I've noticed that I'm wanting to check out more once the kids go to bed, that this is a sign and a flag for me to say, yo, Fong, like really deal with what you're trying to escape from. So that's the first thing. The social media part, they're like, um, I don't know, bloodsuckers that get into your brain. And then I get so emotionally wrapped up because I'm an emotional person. So I'm pissed off about something. And then I start my day Uh pissed off about X, Y, and Z in the world. I also don't watch the news anymore. um, And I don't read newspapers, which sounds uneducated and it's lovely um, because I can't change it. I totally can't change it anymore. So I've just stopped. So people are like, yeah, COVID numbers are, you know, rising or declining. And I was like, oh, are they? Um, So I, 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 it's, I don't think ignorance, it's bliss. I think right now I'm just holding space for me. So that's one mm-hmm. thing I do. Ixnay on that. The other part is um, I find quiet time. And so in the same way that I, before I sit down to do work, I kind of always clean off my area because I need it to look and feel a certain way. If, you know, the whole rest of the house looks shitty, but I'm sitting at my, um, dining room table and I'm going to work there, everything at least in front of me is cleared off. <laughs> 
And so I have to do that for my brain and my heart. And so the way that I do that is just taking a quiet moment. So some people call it meditation. Some people call it prayer. Some people call it sitting there. Whatever it is that you're doing, you are cleaning off the junk in your head and in your heart. And I think people make the assumption that this quiet time should just be this void of nothingness. And it's not. Thoughts come into my brain. Feelings come into my heart. I acknowledge it. And then I say, thank you for coming. And then I bid that thought farewell. Um, I like to listen to music during this time. Or I have a secret garden in my backyard that um, where I find plants or I propagate plants and anyways. And then I have a like a pallet back there. Um, and I'll just sit there and listen to the trees and the birds. Oh. And sometimes it's 10 minutes and sometimes it's one minute, but it all is worthwhile. Uh -huh. So I do that. And if some days I don't have that quiet time, I have been able to find kind of this meditative state in the things that I have to do every day. So I am a person who has been diagnosed with depression and anxiety, and those seasons come and go. I have been on medication, and I have not been on medication, um, and but I always feel anxiety in some capacity, and I and I'm aware of that. My husband, on the other hand, he is so present in life. Like if he walks into a room, like the whole room lights up and he will talk to you. Um, and he is right. Like if Jesse, if he were talking to you right now, he would look at you in the eye and you would feel like you're the most important person in the world. Now, <laughs> he is all of this and he is always late. Like, and this is why he's so proud. We could be all in the minivan with the three kids getting ready to go in the car and he's washing dishes peacefully. Cause he's so damn present. Right. Um, and, and it's wonderful and it's, you know, all of the other things as his <laughs> partner in life. But the thing is, is that whenever he's washing the dishes, I can see it. He's like smiling to himself about whatever's going on in his head. Um, but he, I, I know he's feeling the water and he's like, gently scrubbing the dish, but it's his meditation. And I think, you know, it wasn't until two years ago when I, I mean, shit just hit the fan and I was just, I couldn't show up to work. Like I was just, I can't. Um, and I think this whole, and I've known him since college, um, this whole time I'm like, hello, where are you? Like, we're all in the car or we're all, but it has served him well. <laughs> You know, it's like, he's like, oh, he's right there in the moment. So um, finding meditation and washing dishes, I get my favorite soap. I put on, I have a diffuser with my favorite essential oil. There's this one, it's called Sweet Dreams by Woolsey's. Uh, they're not paying me to say any of this. I don't know what concoction is in this stuff, but it just makes me feel so good. So I do. So I just sit there or I used to um, take a quick shower in the morning. I would pride myself on being so efficient. And then I realized that being efficient was serving me so poorly. So uh -huh. I would wake up in the morning, shower, get dressed, do my hair, do my makeup um, all within 30 minutes. And then I would wake up all the children to get them ready to go to school. And I realized that during that time, I mean, I'm sure the anxiety that was pumped through my system to get to all of our places on time um, just made me sick. So now I just, I take baths, not to say that that's the solution, but it's just being present and it's just giving me time to slow it to, down, to, to give space, to just concentrate. Yeah. On that. yeah. So some of the things that I do. Those are lovely. <laughs> that's like the thing that pops into my head is like, but in like a loving, lovely, like truly lovely way. And I, I, um, I also don't watch the news. I just want to throw that out there to you. It makes me, it makes me want to throw up. It's weird. It's very, uh -huh. um, and it's scary and uh -huh. scary things make me want to throw up. Oh, one last thing I do. I love, I have a bajillion plants, um, and I love watering my plants and then waiting for the water to trickle out of the drain holes. Ooh, that is very meditative. Mm -hmm. Like, um, yeah, I, I'm just like, I'm visualizing that right now. And it's just kind of like watching um, like a fountain, you know, like how, mm -hmm. how you have the, the fountains in your garden that you can sit and meditate at. Yes. I imagine it's just kind of like that. Yeah. So quiet moments. I can't <sighs> change the world. I can't. I want to. And I'm, you know, I am in other work related ways, but in terms of all of the crazy and the chaos and the ache and the pain, 
um, mm-hmm. but I can, I can make the changes within me. For yeah. Now. Yeah. And, you know, like you, you brought up about, you know, like not, I love how you said not inviting a thousand people into your bedroom, um, which like with social media, it's kind of, that is what you're doing. Um, I never thought of it that way, but that is like, that is absolutely true. It's why it bombards our brains so much um, and not checking out. And then how you said it's like, you know, you may not read the news or the newspaper, but it's not necessarily like completely ignoring. It's just not, um, like it, it's that boundary of mm-hmm. protecting so that you can have quiet and you can still have peace. And then, you know, like when we have that, we're better prepared. What is out there in the world that, that is happening, that is out of our control, isn't going to affect us as deeply. Right. It's still caring. It's just yeah. not going, it, and it's not going to eat away at my bandwidth, which I need mm-hmm. for my children and yeah. my partner and my animals and my plants and my yeah. clients that I see, you know, their right. eyeballs are right there. I'm going to concentrate on the people. Yeah. And then from there, putting that out into the world, it helps create a newer, you know, like more connected, more human world, you know, like more humanity in the world. And then from there, those things that are scary, maybe if we all did that, wouldn't be as present. So let's imagine this perfect world that we want, Jesse. Uh, we're going to play a game. <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to volleyball it back and forth. So okay. what would a perfect SLP world would look like? Okay. It would be uh-huh. getting enough sleep at night. Your time. Uh-huh. Uh, it would be having time to not rush in the morning. It would be looking at the eyeballs through the screen or that U-shaped table or through that pe- plexiglass and knowing I'm giving you exactly what you need in the time that you need to serve your communication. Mm. Yes. And it would be in those moments with when, when you're serving and you're doing the therapy, not having to think about what's next or what you're not doing while you're doing that. It would be looking at the eyeballs of the caretakers, of the students and the clients and saying, I will be there for you every step of the way. And you have the time and the resources to do that. And it would be feeling that the work that you do and what you are able to put out into the world is making the change that you're meant to be making. And then the last one, mm-hmm. then at the end of every month, we would get a check <laughs> in our bank account. That is 10 times the amount of what we're getting right now <laughs> because we're worth it. We are. <laughs> Hello. Wouldn't that be, oh. that be amazing. So that's where I'm setting my sight. It's it's saying, yeah. all right, here are the woes, and here is where we are, and the path from the present to the future is unveiling truths if you feel safe enough to do it, and then holding space to sustain yourself in the meantime. Mm-hmm. Yes. Done. This is so easy. Like, why didn't we talk before? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Oh, I love that. I love it. Oh, yes. That's all I can say about that. Yes. <laughs> I appreciate and I'm grateful for the time that I spent alongside you this morning, Jesse. Yes. Thank you. This is, I mean, you know, as we're recording this for people listening, it's a Saturday morning and this is, is like the most lovely, wonderful way to start a weekend. <laughs> well, it's because I'm assuming, I mean, I chose this time because, um, I, this is when I can do it. I'm assuming this is why you scheduled this time. Yes. Yes, exactly. Um, because yeah, I mean, we're SLPs. Life is busy. It's 2020. So that's another level. And then you and I both have kids. (laughs) Yeah. What are you doing the rest of the weekend? 
Uh, it is actually my, um, my, I have a four-year-old and then I have my, my son, my baby, he's turning one on Monday. So this is our weekend to uh, celebrate him and that I can't believe that he is one. It is. We're just so, we're, we have some family that, um, we, we, you know, we, we quarantined kind of for, for two weeks on both ends and they were able to come up so he could, he could, um, meet his grandpa and re-meet his grandma and an uncle and a cousin and, um, and then celebrate a birthday. Yeah. Some really good memories. Yeah. It's awesome. So that is, that is what we're doing. And, um, and it's just going to be great. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. What about you this weekend? Uh, my husband is a huge Halloween person. And every year we are dressed as some theme. So to give you some scope, last year we were all Titanic. I have an 11-year-old, a 9-year-old, and a 5-year-old. And oh, so last year, um, Jeremy, the dad, bearded dad, he was old Rose. And my 11-year-old was Jack. My 9-year-old was Rose. Um, the the 5-year-old was Captain Murdoch because he just wanted to wear the costume. And I was a um, vanilla iceberg. Oh, my gosh. Um, because <laughs> it's just – but this year, um, this year, we're going to be um, Shit's Creek. Oh, my gosh. I love it. And so I think we're trying to figure it all out logistically. Um, so, yeah. So we. I love it. I've, I've just recently, I've just recently started after the Emmys. I have heard everyone talk about Schitt's Creek and just how wonderful of a show it is. And yeah. I was just kind of like, I don't know. Um, because it's one of those things where I I do enjoy watching something in the evenings, but I don't want to just watch something for the sake of like, well, everyone else is doing it. Right. No, like, I'm the same I, I want it. Like, I don't have enough time. I want it to be something really worth watching. And so yes. I was like, I don't know. And then it was one of those nights where I was like, they just won like every Emmy they could. Every, yes. Every and I was like, so, so many people and it's SLPs. So I kind of trust their opinion. <laughs> And I was like, okay, I'm just going to watch one and see. And it was like, I just fell in love with the show. And it's just like, I didn't expect it to be heartwarming. So, it, so much, so much humanity. Speaking of humanity, yes. so much humanity. <laughs> and I mean, I could, I could write a dissertation on it. I could finish right. my PhD if someone would let me write a dissertation <laughs> on Schitt's Creek. And here's the best part. So the little one. Um, so last night he goes, I'm going to be Patrick, Oh, the starfish. So he just listened to us and he knows there's a character named Patrick. And he's like, I'll be, so we're going to get him a Patrick, the starfish from SpongeBob. Is that not amazing? I love it. I love it so much. <laughs> uh, so, but no, it is. It, so SLPs watch it, and I think it supports humanity and families, and they're they're mm -hmm. authentically them, and it supports the LGBTQ community and yes. many intersections of of just people. It's lovely, and it's twenty minutes. That's the thing. It's like you can mm -hmm. watch. You won't be able to stop at twenty minutes. Um, no, I never can. You never can. But um, but if you wanted to, it's twenty minutes, and it just at the end, you're like, oh, I feel like this was like therapy and yoga with goats and mm -hmm. you know uh, like this yeah art and it's wonderful yes oh well that sounds like it's gonna be it's gonna be fun <laughs> well, have a great weekend then, you too thank you so much to fong for taking the time out of all of the really amazing and wonderful things that you have going on to sit and chat with me and talk about what it's really like being an SLP and what we can do to get back to the passion and the joy and thriving while being an SLP. If you would like to find out more about how you can work with Fong or just get to know her even more, check out her website, Fong Lin Palafox dot com or follow her on Instagram or you can also check out her amazing 
book, which is available on Amazon. It's called The Heartbeat of Speech Language Pathology. And I personally have a copy of this book and I love it. It is just so wonderful and heartfelt and goes even deeper into her story and into, you know, this world of being an SLP and what we are all experiencing and going through um, each and every day. So check out those. There are resources for those in the show notes. And as always, thank you all for tuning in and I hope to have you back next time. Well, I don't think it is any secret that being an SLP on a regular year is an incredibly stressful. And the other not so secret, we have no idea how to actually manage our stress. It's not our fault. It is just something that is not in our schooling, our curriculum, and most of us haven't learned this growing up. So if you are ready to start to tackle that stress and to find some tools that will actually work and that are practical to use without adding more stress into your day, then you are ready for one-on-one SLP stress management coaching. This is a brand new offer that is now available for 2021. So head over to jessieandrix.com and click on the top where it says coaching and you can read all about one-on-one coaching and how we can start to work together to personalize your stress management, give you the tools that you need and finally be able to thrive as an SLP. I can't wait to work with you.